Hi, I'm Forrest, and I have a plan to create $100 billion in economic activity. Before I tell you this plan, I'd like to start with a story. It's a story set in the year 2008 in a country with economic regions that are all highly productive but disconnected from one another. In other words, these regions are like islands in a vast sea. I call them islands because these regions were connected by a train with an average speed of only 30 miles an hour. Other modes for transit were either slower or prohibitively expensive themselves. The simple fact is trains going at 30 miles an hour don't have nearly the same power to unify as those going at 200. Fast forward seven years later, and those 30 mile an hour trains have been supplanted by 13,000 miles of high speed rail, more than the rest of the world's networks combined. These formerly isolated islands were no longer disconnected. That's just one part of the story, though. There's a second half. There's a second country with similarly disconnected economic regions that put in plans to connect them with high-speed rail. But this country didn't actually see those plans to fruition. They still, to this day, sit on a drawing board without any action. The two countries I'm speaking of are China and the United States of America. And while both countries had bold visions for the future, only one of them actually got around to implementing that, China. The fundamental problem with these countries operating the way they did is that one had a bold vision and actually acted on it. And this is what I'd like to fundamentally talk to you about here today, is how government can not only have a bold vision, can not only plan for it, can but effectively act to enact it. There's this notion we have it seems this, this bubbling sentiment in dealing with local government and other projects that we work on, it, that government is relegated to this role of fixing potholes and maintaining the status quo. And I want to fundamentally disagree with that notion. I think that is BS, that government does not have to just be fixing what's broken and maintaining, but can actually create bold visions and strive to create a better future with those visions by executing them effectively for the people they're supposed to represent. This sounds like a lot of rhetoric. And at some level it is, but it's backed up by hard facts. Economic and social inclusion, booming economies, and massive innovation are all direct results of this type of thinking being applied in specific examples. It's not just me saying this either. There's a long lineage of history supporting this idea. Things like the Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration. It's a research wing of the US military that's created most of the technology that's sitting in your pocket right now and has enabled your life as you know it today. The internet. GPS, self-driving cars, all of these different technologies came out of bold visions like this. In a more political sense, you could look at the Marshall Plan and what it did to rebuild Europe after the devastation of World War II and turn it into the economic and cultural juggernaut that it is today, with free democracy and a bright future ahead of it. Or to come back to our own context, the Eisenhower Expressway System. It was a group of road networks that connected and unified America, and is actually part of the reason I'm able to be here today to talk with you guys. I drove all the way from North Carolina on this exact system that bold change implemented 50 or so years ago. Circling, circling back, there's a great example of this in my home state of North Carolina. In the middle of the 1800s, there was a governor named John Motley Moorhead. Governor Moorhead was a bold advocate for creating futures by investing in infrastructure and education and public health and other different initiatives that he could put resources and effort into to actually move us and move the needle forward. One of his, his biggest projects was he organized a group of private investors that worked with the government in North Carolina to finance a railroad going from Charlotte to Raleigh and then on to the coast. So it unified the economic centers of the industrial manufacturing to the agricultural heartland to the shipping and the ports where it connected them to the rest of the world. This action by Governor Moorhead in the middle of the 1800s created and charted the future for North Carolina. It's what made North Carolina grow into the, the state that it is today and charted its course for all the 20th century. I want to take what Governor Moorhead did and build upon it for the 21st. Our project is called South Rail. It's a public-private partnership to create a high-speed rail line along that same corridor that Governor Moorhead made all those years ago to upgrade it so that it can go between the two largest cities in North Carolina, Charlotte and Raleigh. It cuts the trip down from the current four hours to two hours with intermediary stops. It directly generates 
billions of dollars of real estate investment and will create a fundamental backbone for our state for both transportation and economic development. The project connects two regions that are some of the fastest growing in the country. Charlotte and Raleigh both approach 20% growth rates annually and have been doing so for the last 10 years and are projected to do so for the next. This is the fundamental economic engine of our state, and it's not connected right now. We want to not only connect it, but create a unified crescent that's linking the economic activity that's happening in these two metropolitan areas to all the small towns and industrial cities along the corridor that have had their industry walk away. Th those places that the modern economy with globalization and automation and technology have forgotten because we no longer need the tobacco mills and the manufacturing and the other components that used to be the backbone of what they had. We want to link them and put them into the watershed of all this great growth that's happening so that we don't just have two cities, but we have a unified state again. And it's something that we've been able to get most people on both sides of the party behind. This kind of came out of an inspiration from a project down in Florida called Brightline, which is a link to another 1800s rail project by a guy named Henry Flagler. I don't know if you guys have studied Standard Oil at all, but the, the oil company that basically helped invent American capitalism, one of the right-hand guys on that was a dude named Henry Flagler, who, aside from doing his oil stuff, was super big into railroads down in Florida. So the long, long, long grandson of his company still owns the corridor today and has put almost $3 billion into creating a privately funded high-speed rail line connecting West Palm Beach to Miami with an extension to Orlando under construction as we speak. This isn't just a hypothetical. This is something that you can actually go ride on, which started service about two months ago in Florida. So there, for the first time in 50 years, is a privately operated, for-profit, high-speed passenger rail service in the United States. This got me excited. This got me really excited, because I, I thought that there was a similar thing that we could do in North Carolina. So I started diving in and seeing what we could do and seeing if it was actually feasible. To my astonishment, not only was it feasible, but we had so many factors that put us in such a better position to go pursue a project like this that even Florida looked like it was going to be pennies compared to what we could do with this project. So that's how we got to South Rail. I've told you kind of what it is. I want to tell you how we're going to do it. So the project itself will be a public-private partnership, meaning that private enterprise is working with government to create a solution that either party couldn't really do on their own. We are working with the North Carolina Railroad, which is one of the unique characteristics that allows us to do this. North Carolina still owns the corridor between Charlotte and Raleigh, thanks to the work of the governor from all those years ago. This is really important because in most other parts of the US, outside the Northeast Corridor, so going from Boston down to DC, Everywhere else in the US, the rail is owned by freight companies, and they don't want our passengers on there. It's a pain for them to have to deal with, and you have to jump through a million and one hoops to have any sort of passenger improvement happen on other rail. So because we own this corridor, we have the ability to actually forge a better course. We're working with this group to go and build off of a model that the Italians actually created. They called it open access. So this was a thing that the, back in the mid-2000s, a group of Italian entrepreneurs, including the CEO of Ferrari, of all companies, decided they wanted to have their own high-speed rail service. So they lobbied the Italian government to create this model where they could go out and actually rent access to this corridor so they could run their own trains and they could actually compete on how great their service was and how fast the trains were and all, the, all these different components that they thought that they could make a better difference on. And what you've seen in Italy is this drastic reduction of cost per ticket. I was there a few months back, and a, a trip between two large cities there, like the distance between New York and D.C., for example, was something like $30 for a high-speed train that got you there in an hour and a half. That's the power of this type of bold, innovative thinking. And we're applying that in North Carolina. So we're taking that model, but we're taking it a step further. We're using it to finance infrastructure improvements for the entire corridor. So we're paying them rent payments that then they will use to service debt on a loan that is actually increasing the corridor's overall capacity, speed, and safety. And not just servicing us, but freight and other Amtrak services going through it. So we're using this model to drive this private support for an incredibly productive part of the North Carolina backbone. It doesn't stop there, though. We don't want to just run trains. Trains are great, but they have to go somewhere. And what better thing than having a hand in where those trains actually go? So the unique characteristic of North Carolina and our network is there's all this land around the tr train stations and along the corridor that's owned by either the local governments or the state itself. We want to take that and actually make an effort to create 
urban, walkable, transit-oriented communities around these places so that we don't have to go the route of Atlanta and deal with constant sprawl and, and live in these conditions where growth is a detrimental aspect. We, growth should not be a dirty word if done properly. There's this concept in traffic study called induced demand, where if you build an extra lane on a highway, basically the, the demand grows to fill that lane. So you have this inevitable arms race of building additional roads that lead to greater suburbs that lead to additional roads. And you student go from having a congested two-lane road to having a congested eight-lane road. That model kind of works with trains, but the difference is it's a good thing. We can induce demand and actually be getting the passengers to be coming to our, our trains by developing around the station corridors. So with doing the development, the rail, and all the components of it, we can not only shape a new way to connect North Carolina, but we can have a really strong hand in shaping how it grows and develops into the future. This kind of gets to the why of this. North Carolina is a state that has a lot going for it, but isn't quite over that edge. It, it, I'm from there, so I have a very nuanced understanding that's far more than you guys in this, so I don't want to go into too deep into history here. But the, the, the basic thing is it's right there on the edge. It's, one of the, it's almost one of the larger economies in the, the country. It's number 10 in terms of economic output. It has all these industries going for it. It has banking, biotechnology, great universities. It's right there, but no one's synthesizing it together. And that's what we want to do, is take all these disparate components and synthesize it into something that is a better future that North Carolinians can get behind. And take this model not just in North Carolina, but beyond, so we can run trains into Virginia and down into Georgia and connecting Atlanta, so that this model can be applied to not only just building a better North Carolina, but building a better transit-connected future for our southern cities. This matters for a really important reason. North Carolina has the ability to not only create a more inclusive social and economic society, where the, the, the rural areas that have been got that have lost their way with the changing in the economy can now be part of a greater whole. It creates a scenario where we can attract businesses like Amazon and all these other great firms that should have a home in our state. And finally, it creates a place where people actually want to live, where I can get on a train and have a better future. I want to leave you guys with a similar story to where I started. It's a story of two women. They're very similar, but they have very different lives. One of them lives in a rural province and has limited access to social and economic mobility. She is kind of stuck where she is. There's not much she can really do. To doesn't matter how hard she works. There's a, there's a ceiling that keeps her from growing higher. There's another woman who has a very similar background. In, er, he, she lives in a bustling city with a beautiful home and a career that she's fulfilled and has the prospect for growth in. She can go home to her family when she wants to. She can travel the world, and she has the life at her fingertips. The story is a sounds like a hypothetical, but it's actually the reality in China before and after high-speed rail. <clears throat> this is highlighted by this one really, really interesting fact that caught me in the research for this presentation here. There is a festival called Chinese New Year, where a lot of people travel to and from their, wherever they're working to their homes. This past one in 2018, saw 390 million people traveling back to their homes via rail. This represents the largest migration in history of humanity. I, I repeat that again. The, the, a network that didn't exist 10 years ago enabled the largest migration of the, in the history of humanity. This network was enabled by government having not only the creative ability to go and create a vision, but also to be able to effectively execute on that vision to create a better future for the people that it represents. That, my friends, is an idea worth spreading.